It has been six months since my last update about the off-grid power system here at Everstoke. As you can see, we got the solar panels built and a bunch of other little stuff buttoned up. That six months went by way too quick. I still have a ton to do, but let me walk you through it. When we first bought this land three years ago, the only thing out here was a beat up, dusty dirt road. Then we got our hands on a Blue Eddy portable power station. Blue Eddy's the sponsor of this video and I'll be talking about their new power station a little bit later. We used and abused that thing for a couple of years. It got us through so much. And even though this whole video is about a big solar power system that could pretty much power any regular American home, I still find myself using the Blue Eddy portable power stations in very remote locations that you ain't gonna get an extension cord to. So everything in this video will be an example of what you could do at an off-grid property. But even if you're on the grid in a normal neighborhood, it's really time to think about doing something like this, setting some solar panels up in your backyard if it's big enough, getting batteries, getting an inverter. There is a lot of advantages to being your own power plant. It is pretty tough to justify doing a DIY project like this if your power is already pretty cheap and already to your property. Our neighbors paid $30,000 to get the grid to their property, and then they still have an electric bill. By the time I'm finished with this project, I think I'll be $15,000 all in but that's also just using my own labor not paying for labor i'm guessing it would be three times more expensive if you actually paid someone to do all this so before i actually had to generate my own power at everstoke i didn't understand volts amps watts kilowatt hours how much energy various appliances actually use i knew hair dryers and space heaters take a lot of energy to work but it's probably the same as a refrigerator right I ended up learning very quickly that most things don't actually take that much power until you get into heating or cooling, like microwaves, air fryers, or air conditioning. The refrigerator is actually kind of an exception. It does pretty dang good without having to use too much energy. So every house is different, every appliance is different, but the one constant is that we all use kilowatt hours of energy, and that is what's on everyone's electric bill. Now here's the thing, if you walk up to anyone in America and you ask them, how much did you happen to pay for a gallon of gas the last time you filled up your car, they will probably know. And they'll probably have a pretty good idea of the mileage that their car gets. For me, it was $5.10 the last time I filled up my van and I get about 14 miles per gallon. But then if you ask somebody about the energy use at their home, they probably know what they pay on their electric bill, but there's no way they know how many kilowatt hours they used and what they pay for those kilowatt hours. So take a second to go grab your last energy bill. Somewhere on that bill, it will say how many kilowatt hours of electricity you used last month. Mine even has a little chart that shows my use per day and the average I use every day. So what is a kilowatt hour? It's actually kind of simple. If you had a couple solar panels that generated 1000 watts and those panels sat out in the sun for just one hour, you would have generated one kilowatt hour of energy. My electric bill is through PG&E and it is an absolute mess. There's a delivery fee, there's a generation fee, there's credits, there's taxes, there's fees up the wazoo. All you have to do is take the price you paid for electricity and divide that by how much electricity you used. Last month, my bill was $107 for using 257 kilowatt hours. That's 42 cents per kilowatt hour. That is right there at the top of the national price, neck and neck with Hawaii. To get a bit better average of what I use at my house, I was actually able to download the past three years of my bills, and I use about 300 kilowatt hours per month on average, which comes out to around $126 per month. So let's pretend like I'm doing this whole big DIY solar setup in my own backyard. I got the permits. It cost me 20,000 bucks with my own labor, help from an electrician. I got it properly hooked into the grid and approved by PG&E. 
That means I would zero out my $126 per month electricity bill and it would take me about 13 years and three months to fully pay back that $20,000. And after that, you are free and clear. And that timeline is only if the price of electricity doesn't jump up over the next 13 years. How much you wanna bet we're gonna be paying a little bit more for electricity next year, and the next year after that, and the next year after that. So I'm only using about 300 kilowatt hours per month, but my big bad solar system is probably conservatively gonna put out 1800 watts per month, about six times what I'm using. So if I was doing this at my house, I would have a lot of room to switch over my gas appliances over to electric, get an electric heat pump water heater, do an induction cooktop stove, install a few electric mini splits to heat and cool different rooms of the house. I'm spending about 40 bucks a month on my gas bill and the bulk of that is in the winter for heating. If I spent another 10,000 bucks electrifying every appliance in my house and I had to redo all the math and said I spent $30,000 turning my whole house electric and that would end up neutralizing $166 a month for my full energy bill, it would take 15 years to go free and clear, only an extra two years. A pretty massive price at the beginning, but slowly but surely you pay the thing off and then you ride off into the sunset as long as all the components keep working for 20 or 30 years. Now, if I wanted to add an electric car to the mix, I think I would be able to do it, but eventually you're gonna need another inverter, more batteries or five if you really wanna go crazy. So that's a very specific example of my house, my use, my cost, but I really hope it helps you wrap your head around this whole thing. If you're not quite ready to jump headfirst into the mega version of a DIY power system, the Blue Eddy AC180 is the super simple, small and mighty way to get your first taste of DIY power. The AC180 delivers 1800 watts of continuous AC power, which will pretty much power anything on a normal 15 amp circuit. If you put the unit into power lifting mode, you can output 2700 watts, which means you can run some really intense loads like hair dryers, electric kettles, and space heaters. When the AC180 needs a refill on power, put it into turbo mode and you can go from 0% to 80% in just 45 minutes. The capacity of the battery is 1152 watts, which is enough to recharge a laptop 17 times, charge your phone up 103 times, run a fan for 26 hours, or run an LED light for 103 hours. The AC180 uses LFP battery chemistry, the best and most durable in the business, which means you can charge and discharge your battery every day for 10 plus years. Even the app is fantastic. I use it every single day with the Blue Eddy in my van. If you need more energy, you can always buy extra batteries and hook them up to this unit. The AC180 can take up to 500 watts of solar, which is all I would need in my office right here to take it off grid. But even without solar panels, you can use the AC180 as a whole room battery backup for if, or should I say when, the power goes out. So I've done my own little long-term load test. Over the past week, I've had every single thing plugged into the AC180 with my bright lights, my fan, computer monitor, laptop, all the million little electronics I have here in the shed. When everything is on, I'm running about 300 watts, which is not that bad at all. If the power went out and the AC180 was at 100% charge, I could go for about four hours full blast. And I'm only running my really bright lights when I'm actually recording a video. So if I turn those things off, my baseline power is only 90 watts, which means on a full AC180 charge, I could go for more than 10 hours on just 90 watts. It's amazing. I really, really need to get my shed off grid. I need to get some solar panels and take this thing energy independent. Blue Eddy is power you can always rely on, and I have been relying on Blue Eddy for the past several years. Check the link in the description to find the latest deals on the AC180. Thanks to Blue Eddy for sponsoring this video. And getting back to Everstoke, 
This whole system is gonna be glorious overkill. We're gonna produce much more energy than we ever use until we start adding electric car charging. So the big flashy update is that we have gone from a measly four solar panels up to 24, an amazing big array up on this hill. There's only 12 of them working right now because I'm maxed out on my wires and I need to run a trench and I need to do conduit. So I've got my temporary setup that's working really good. I don't have to worry about making it through the day anymore. These panels are rocking and rolling. It was a massive undertaking. Originally, I was gonna do 28 panels, but for every panel, I had to dig a big old hole and me and my dad poured a big old pier for concrete. I gave up at 24 <laughs> instead of 28, but the math of balancing the inverter and all the voltage and everything, it works pretty good to have two separate strings of 12 panels. Whew. These are 400 watt panels from Canadian Solar. I bought a whole pallet from Signature Solar, a great place to buy your DIY solar products. Pretty much everything in here will have a link in the description, an affiliate link. So if you happen to buy something from the site, I get a little kickback because I really like working with Signature Solar. So with 24 panels at 400 watts, the potential, the upper end of this system is gonna put out 9.6 kilowatts. I don't know if I'll ever see that amount of power. I'm very curious to see once everything gets up and running and everything's properly stringed out and I don't have much voltage drop, what I'm actually going to see. I'm not that hopeful that I'm going to get that full 9.6. One of the big things that's going to keep me from getting the perfect 400 watts is I'm not perfectly aligned south and I'm just going to keep these panels at a 30 degree slope the whole year. I'm not going to mess with it and tilt it up in the summer and tilt it down in the winter. It's fine how it is. And on top of the concrete piers, I use the EG4 Bright Mount Solar Racking System. Pretty dang good system to work with. Pretty easy, just a little time consuming when you have to do six of them. It's four panels per uh, rack mount. Now we're moving from the panels into the brains of the system. And for most people, the brains of their electrical system is their service panel, their electrical panel, their breaker box, but not here. This is the real power plant. This is the real brains behind the system, the EG4 18K PV. It's able to take the DC energy from the solar panels and store it in a battery, retrieve it from a battery, convert it from DC to AC and send it out. It does all that stuff without you ever having to think about it. But you do have to do a lot of thinking to get this to work the first time. It was a bear of an install. I really dislike the software that's built into this. The manual that came, throw that thing away and go print out the manual that's actually attached to the product online. But once everything gets up and running, you don't have to check on it every single day. I'm happy now. I bought the inverter along with the battery all in one package and this nice little box in between that makes all the wires look nice. They call it the PowerPro ESS energy storage system. This system is rated for outdoor use. It can get very cold. It has its own heater inside of it, which is a huge bonus because it got down to three degrees earlier this year and this thing never skipped a beat. One giant improvement that I would love to see with this whole EG4 system is the software. Blue Eddy nails the software, the app. It just looks good, it feels good. You see everything you need to see. The EG4 software, I ditched it as soon as I heard about this other software system called Solar Assistant. It's a bit of a project to get it all set up, but this whole thing is a bit of a project to get going. You need to have a dedicated Raspberry Pi system to run the software. The Solar Assistant software is able to grab all the data coming off the inverter and put it into a much more beautiful package. This is the app I'm living in all day, every day, especially as the system is new and I'm changing things all the time and I'm curious what the solar panels are doing, how much load is in the system. I'm just in the solar assistant so much. Eventually, this is probably all gonna fade into the background. I don't know how much you go into the backyard and see how much your electrical meter is spinning. You've probably done it twice in your life or something when you knew it was a hot day, but otherwise, you turn on the light switch, it works. But out here, you turn on the light switch, it might not work, and I have to diagnose the problem. 
It's a $60 one-time software fee for Solar Assistant, but it also unlocks the ability to use my previously dumb inverter with Home Assistant. If you've never heard of Home Assistant, it's kind of like the Google Home ecosystem with automations, but on steroids, it's very intricate, it's very intimidating, but I'm so glad I actually finally got into Home Assistant and set up a bunch of automations for out here at Everstoke. The sky is the limit now. One of the best automations I had running during the winter quite a bit was when the battery drops below 30%, turn on my generator and run it for two hours. Even on short winter days, even with just four panels and 1200 watts maximum, we still did pretty dang good with all the power out here, especially keeping the pipes from freezing. I had to do a lot of different heat tape stuff and it all worked, but on a cloudy day, on a snowy day, then all the power gets zapped out and the generator would have to kick on to save the day. Of course, a gas generator is not completely hands-free. I would still have to show up and fill the generator with gas, but that way I could go away for a couple weeks at a time and everything would just work. And of course I could be in St. George, Utah on a bike ride, get out my phone and see what was going on back here. The last big piece of the puzzle in this whole system that I still need to get up and running is this EG4 charge verter. During the winter, when I would run the generator, I had it running directly into the inverter, which EG4 says is a big no-no. You just have bad, dirty power going into the inverter, which is the number one cause of breakage of these things. And the number one cause of death for bugs out here is the electric fly swatter. So once I get this thing fully hooked up, the generator will put its dirty power in the charge verter. The charge verter will clean it up and charge the big battery directly. So you don't have to go through the inverter and bother anything at all. Whenever I would run the generator, you could tell there was a little bit of switch over, the lights would flicker, and you just hate that. It's much better to have the generator charging the batteries. You don't have any switch over. You don't have any weird delay or lag. It has taken me way too long to actually get this going because I've been so intimidated about working with this 2 aught battery cable. I have to buy a special tool to cut these cables. I have to buy a special tool to cramp on a battery lug. I can do the bus bar. I can do the junction box. All that stuff will be easy, but I just need to bite the bullet and get these cables crimped and, and learn while I'm doing, like I've learned everything else. So now that my power plant is up and running, I need to tap into it. I need to harness that power and distribute it to where I need it the most. One of the big things I'm doing with this panel, which will be expensive, but I think will give me some really good peace of mind, is putting arc fault, ground fault combination breakers inside every single slot. Right now, it's not done that way. I still need to buy and order some more breakers, but eventually I'll have full protection at the panel for every single plug. All the electricians I talk to really don't like arc fault, ground fault breakers because of all the nuisance tripping. It's like stuff that happens and you're not sure why it's tripping, but as I've built all this, learning on the job, I've made a couple mistakes and every single time the breaker tripped for a reason because I was doing something wrong. So for me, it's the ultimate insurance. It's only 10 times more expensive. <laughs> a normal cheapo breaker is like seven bucks. These nice ones are 70 bucks. I'm also using the Emporia View system to track the load on every single circuit. Once again, I just want all the data to be able to see what's happening, solve problems before they get out of hand. Also, you know, circuit level tracking is great, but then outlet level tracking is even better for every single specific thing. Then you just get into crazy town. But I do want to be able to know when the septic pump is running, when the well pump is running. And then you kind of have an idea where, wait a second, the well pump has been running for seven minutes, where normally it's only supposed to run for one minute. You can diagnose those problems way earlier if you have the data and you look at it or even set up some automations to just, hey, something seems weird here, send you a push notification. I have so many ideas for making this a smart home, smart homestead, off grid. I'll probably come up with a whole video of stuff eventually. I wanna get my own water meter out here because right now I don't even know how much water I use. It's coming off the well, so it doesn't really matter, but it's nice to know what the average is. It is still gonna be a while till I have my full on automation fantasy out here, but I have laid a 
great foundation, so much more to get done, so many more trails to ride. I do realize that I may have left out a couple details, so check the links in the description for all the different products I talked about for different specs and all that. They're all there. <sighs> Thanks for watching, you guys. I'll see you on the trail.